little bit on the thoughts on leadership and things like that, which I will be coming very quickly on that. But I want to share briefly, people asked me to share my testimony. So probably the first uh, session, I will just briefly tell my, share my testimony and also to tell some of the values and principles that I have learned growing up as a young boy. So I grew up in a state called Tamil Nadu, that is southern part of India. I come from a middle class poor family, actually, and uh, we are five siblings. And when I was born, I'm the third in the family, when I was born, uh, my father, he had a kind of a vision for me. And, uh, and that is which, you know, God will take me to nations to be a blessing. So he gave me the name Benjamin Levi Moses. I had no understanding or idea of what does it really mean, nations at the time, because uh, my focus was all about uh, what would I read. <laughs> I never sat on a chair, as Marcus said yesterday, or slept on a bed until I was 18 years old. I mean, at, at, at home, at school, sorry, at my home, not at the school. <laughs> so, um, there were a lot of, quite a lot of challenges growing up. Um, I mean, but the good thing is that uh, we come from a very strong, believing family. My parents believed in the Lord very strongly. We looked up to the Lord and uh, we completely depend on Him for everything. Uh, yes. Um, are they first generation Christians? My parents, yes. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so, um, because of my calling, uh, what my uh, parents did that they thought they would send me to a private English medium school, which is very, very um, difficult for them to afford to pay for the school fees. Uh, and I mean, in some places it's different, but in India, if you want to go to an English private medium school, you have to pay a lot. So that was a challenging thing for me because among the other siblings, only I had the opportunity to go to a private English medium school. But at the same time, uh, it wasn't easy for my father to pay the school fees. So there were times where he used to donate his blood, get some money, you pay the school fees and all those things. So quite a lot of sacrifice and I'm sure many of you can relate uh, with this thing that I'm sharing because uh, all of people are coming from different parts of the world, different ways of life. So you, some of you understand what does it really mean to grow up in a poor family. But I'm not saying that it was depressive and sad and because materially we were poor, everything was so sick and now we enjoyed our life to the fullest, absolutely because we saw the hand of the Lord in everything we did and everything we do or whatever happened. We saw his guidance and we really felt the presence of the Lord every moment of our lives. Uh, at the same time, I mean, um, well, my life was a very different um, grew up. I was out of the box kind of a person. So I started to question things, challenge things, extremely naughty, all of those things. So in the school, I failed three times. They really was extremely mischievous, so the principal of the school teacher kind of failed me three times, although I was very good at studies. Um, yeah, uh, growing up, it was not easy for us uh, to practice our faith in a sense that we were surrounded by um, religious fanatics around a uh, place. My, and they didn't like us because we were believers, we were Christians. Yeah. And um, <clears throat> my father um, is a, a very committed believer. Uh, his name is Moses. I mean, he he always had a Bible with him in his hand. <laughs> he worked for the fire department. And um, there are certain things that I learned from my dad, as my, <clears throat> from dad and mom, especially my dad, is that uh, to keep time. It was always on time, absolutely was always on time, wherever he went and uh, whatever he did. And then he was always talking about Jesus, but at the same time, he lived his life exactly as the word requires of us to live. So at the workplace, they called him Jesus. Mm -hmm. Although his name is Moses, they would say Jesus is coming. Mm -hmm. So that's a kind of a witness that he had. But he was also a very happy man. He used to sing too loud. and uh, So somehow he was hated for no reason. Uh, my yeah. surrounding. So just uh, let me keep my timing, otherwise I'll keep on talking. <laughs> um, 
1983, um, 81, it started, you know, these people want to kind of kill my dad. That's what they really wanted to plan to uh, kill my dad. Um, they started to do all bad things. They were like um, six or seven families. Uh, they started to do all bad things in a sense, you know, they started to talk bad about my family and accuse things for nothing, no reason. And uh, mm. we had a cow at home. That's the only source of our nutrition. That's the milk. So one day they came and they cut the udder of the cow oh and uh, it bleed to death. So they did all this kind of things, you know. I mean, as children, we were, they didn't know what's going on. Um, but uh, yeah, uh, I mean, it was not easy when people around uh, in the school and others, they talk bad about your parents. They say, oh, your parents are doing bad things and all those things. As I said, for no reason, they accused us and our family. At the same time, in the year 1983, uh, you know, that was a day I used to get a lot of dreams. Mm. So that's one of the dreams that I saw that morning, that night was my dad was holding his hand and blood was coming through his eyes. So I was, it was very depressive for me, you know, like very sad and gloomy. I told my dad that I just had a dream that where I saw blood was coming through your eyes. But my dad said, you know, the Lord is good and faithful. And so that's all he said. He went to church, came back. And these guys, uh, you know, the fanatics, they hired some hooligans. And my brothers were playing outside. And my father was sitting outside. And uh, I don't know what he was doing. But they came and they started to beat my brother. Mm. And so my father ran to rescue, um, uh, you know, my older brother. And so what they did, these guys, they all came and they took hold of my father and they, and the, there, was a, there was a guy who was our neighbor, he took a huge stone and he hit with that stone with such a force, it hit him and it broke the bones, you know, and blood was gushing as if you break the water pipe. So he fell, uh, he held his hands and he fell on the floor and they took him to the hospital, we were all crying. We didn't know what was really going on. And uh, at the same time, these guys who did this, they cut themselves with knives. They went to the police and said, my father did this. Uh, it's, it's really, it's very sad as a child that you grew up to see your parents as your heroes. And then my father was a very strong man. He did a lot of award. But then I was also very surprised. He didn't put up a fight. Yeah. He would have done something. He just took it. So it was at the hospital. Police comes to arrest him. But thankfully, at the time, the um, the, the the chief, uh, of, sorry, fire officer and others, they came, they were there, and they know my father, and so they spoke, and he was in the hospital. So thankfully, they didn't arrest him. So three months, he was in the hospital, and then the result came that he lost his eyesight completely. Not the both of them, one of the eyes, zero vision. So, so we used to visit um, my, um, I mean, my dad in the hospital, mm -hmm. Every night I used to cry thinking that, you know, such a, it's very hard to imagine, uh, you know, what has happened. But, but my father used to bring us all together and then he would say, let's pray and pray for these people and that God would forgive them. Mm -hmm. So it was absolutely for me, it has no sense at all. So I was thinking somebody should take revenge. Somebody should beat these guys. You know, it's... It's, it's not right, that's injustice, and there should be something done to it. And then I thought that all that, whatever I thought about my dad as a strong man, I th thought that he was weak. He didn't have the courage to do something about it, and I thought well, forgiveness was weak. You know, it's not only for weak people. But anyways, so he used to come um, call us to pray. And within these three months when he was in the hospital, something very bad happened to all these families who were involved. Whether by electrocution or brain fever, in every family there was a death in three months' time. So the whole, the whole um, uh, town was saying that oh, because they did what they did to Moses, God is punishing them. Wow. Well, anyways, my father would say we should never entertain such a thought, and we should pray for their salvation and all those things. Anyways. Um, I grew up with resentment and uh, anger, bitterness, and all those things. After 10 years, we moved from that place. And then my father looked, was 
he was in the marketplace and then he met uh, this guy who beat my father took his eyesight so he's a young man uh, he was uh, at the time in his uh, mid 20s or so so what my father did was he just grabbed him you know he was really very really afraid he thought that somebody is going to beat him someday and he was in hiding and he caught hold of him and then he said uh, how are you doing you know he could not really look up and to say anything put his head down and he said i'm so sorry for what i did to you and uh, and please forgive me and my father said look at me and then he said to him you know i have forgiven you the very day you took my eyes back Uh, this was very difficult for him to understand. I mean, the concept of forgiveness. He thought my dad would take revenge and all those things. And then he said, "How would you? How could you forgive me? I mean, I did such a bad thing." And my father said, "I could only forgive you because of what God and Jesus has forgiven me." And he shared the gospel with this guy, and within three weeks, he gave his life to Christ. Wow! And now he and his family are serving the Lord. I mean, they are pastors and they are pastoring a good church. So it took a long time for me to understand the power of forgiveness and uh, what God can do. Well, um, moving up with my story, I, anyways, I told about my failures and everything, and I finished my school. And so here comes the time that my uh, I, I thought that okay, if I have to serve the nations. God is calling me that I should go to a good Bible college to study. So I found a good one, and then it was in Choi State uh, in Vishakhapatnam, and uh, but then I have to pay the fee. So I will go to my dad. Dad, I want to go to this Bible college. My dad said, "Okay, you can go, but I don't have the money to pay you." Absolutely, I mean he didn't have anything to pay. So I was very disappointed. Oh, what's this coming to at the end? Uh, nothing. I mean, I finished my tenth class, and then there is nothing much to move forward. My dad don't have the money. How am I going to survive? And what is this all about? God taking me to nations and everything. There was no idea whatsoever. But my father said, "I know someone who can help you with money or with your studies." So I was just thinking, man, the, he has kept it as a secret for all these years. He never asked anything to this man, whomsoever it is. So I was very excited. He said, "Go bring a pen and paper." So I brought a pen and paper, and then he said, "You know him?" Uh, I said, "No, I don't know. I mean, you know him. His name is Jesus." Mm. <laughs> and he said, "Okay, go to your room, lock your room, and pray, and write a letter to the college." Uh, well, I mean, I don't know how to write. My English was really poor. I don't know how to write for scholars for scholarship. But he said, "No, you just go and write." So I went to my room. I really prayed. And uh, I don't know how I wrote. I said, "Sir, Madam, no money, studies. I want, please help." Very broken English, completely. And uh, and then I came to my dad and I wanted to ask him to proofread it. My dad said, "No, this is between you and Jesus. So wow. go and, go and post the letter." Well, I did post the letter. I was hundred percent sure nobody is going to come back to it on that. After three months, I get a letter saying, "Congratulations, Benjamin! Somebody has come to sponsor your studies." Wow. And four What? years. This was really wow. incredible and amazing. I have no idea which country, who, where, what, he, she. No idea whatsoever. But I was always thankful. I prayed for this person every day. Uh, I mean, throughout my Bible college time. So uh, that's making the story got you know for me I thought Bible college would be like I have no idea what Bible college was all about. I thought every day you have to pray, read the Bible. It's like kind of you know all clothes in white, angels everywhere. Mm -hmm. This is my understanding. Absolutely, I had no idea. I saw I told my friend, you know, I was as I said I was really very mischievous in my childhood days. I said I'm going to a place. It's kind of a concentration camp. I can't sin. I can't do anything. There is no, no, absolutely no, no fun, nothing. So we went and watched movie for like three to four weeks every day. So that's what I thought. Then it's finished. Then we are starting something new. Well, after going to the Bible college, that was a different story, anyways. Um, God was always His hand was always there throughout my life, and of course I was also kind of dismissed in the Bible college for stupid things that I did. 
but they called me back. It's a miracle again. And I finished my uh, bachelor's for four years. And then God opened doors again with somebody coming to sponsor my studies for my master's wow. in a very reputed college in, in Kerala, that's uh, the southern part of India. Mm -hmm. I prayed to the Lord, Lord, I want to pass with first class. No, with good name. That's what my prayer was. Because I know my character, my nature. I was always there to ask questions, challenge things, and uh, all those kind of things. So <clears throat> by the time I finished my master, uh, master of Divinity, I, you know, it was amazing to say I was uh, the graduation speaker. I passed in first class, and I got the all-rounder um, thing. And um, it's 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 a simple prayer that how God honored and blessed me with. So finishing studies, and then. I went to Delhi and of course I also did my Master of Arts in Public Administration uh, and then I was working for an international Christian organization. I was heading the Advanced Christian Leadership Development and I worked with YMCA. That's where I found my wife whom you will be meeting tomorrow and uh, this was a great journey and uh, in 1999 we got married and God opened doors for us to come to Switzerland in the year 2000. I mean she got the scholarship to do a federal scholarship to do a PhD in business management in Switzerland. And in India, it's a reverse. It's the husband who goes and then open the doors and kind of wife follows up. But in our case, it was completely the reverse. Of, she got a federal scholarship and it was not easy for us, uh, for her especially, to leave family, leave me. We were married for nine months and then we don't know what, how long I have to wait and coming and all those things. But we prayed and we know that it is the Lord who is opening the door. So I gave her blessings and then, you know, it was, <laughs> she, uh, it, the initial days was very challenging. And the scholarship money that she received, those days we didn't have mobile phones and it was in 2000. I mean, we had mobile phones, but very expensive to make calls. And she spent all the money by making phone calls. And all that she did was call and cry. Oh. <laughs> it was because it was very difficult to, um, for the first time in her life, she was, staying out of a family and leaving country, everything was very difficult. But God made a very strong, God really made a very strong during this time. And uh, what happened was uh, we thought that maybe my waiting time would be like two weeks or maximum three, four weeks. Uh, because I got my PhD, uh, my admission to do my PhD at the same university in theology. But then the immigration things that the paperwork and stuff like that, everything has to be translated in German or in French and all those things. So back and forth, the process for waiting became 10 months. So we were only married for nine months and waited for 10 months. It was not very easy. But the good thing in that God made her also very strong, depend on him. And uh, she has written a lot of diaries of letters to Jesus, wow. all those kind of things, but complete dependency in God. And, uh, so, 2001, God brought us to Switzerland, and in 2005, uh, I'm going to be finishing our studies, and I told Jesse that, honey, somebody sponsored me to, uh, you know, do my studies, and God opened doors for us to be here in Switzerland, I mean, for me to be in Switzerland. So I want to do something for, uh, you know, girl children who are coming from single mother families for education, you know, give them opportunity to learn and grow. I mean, you wish I had somebody sponsored my school, but that didn't happen, but somebody did for my college. So we thought that why don't we give an opportunity for girl children? Because in India, in some places, it's very difficult for, for poor girl children. They are exploited either in human trafficking or, I don't know, prostitution and all those things. So we thought that, okay, why don't we do something by providing education? So we started the Foundation for Indian Children Future in 2005 with sponsoring one child. At the time, you know, we were students. We didn't have the money to do that. So I told Jesse, uh, honey, we let's uh, do it when we have a job. She said, if the Lord speaks to you now, you should do it immediately. So with the little that we had, we started this foundation in India. With, uh, we registered with the government of India. We started with one girl. And we have a board here in Switzerland. And now we are supporting like 3,000 children wow. all over India. So that's generosity. I mean, generosity has to be spread. It's, we cannot, I can't find the person who sponsored me and uh, can't go back. I don't know who that person, but we can do for others. You know, that's how well it, it multiplies. And these children would multiply in many fold to do for the other people. Okay. So we also not only are doing the educational project, we are also doing, um, uh, what is it called, community development 
and so many other things. So that's that's little part of our work. And then in 2008, um, you know, we finished everything. We wanted to go back. We had both of our children were born in the early 2000, and so we thought we'd go back to India and then start our work that God has given us. But God stopped everything, really, literally. Um, in the early stages of uh, when our children were born, both of them are born with some precondition issues, or prenatal issues, and so uh, the doctor said they have to stay there for surgery and all those things for the younger son. So that's how we stayed, and then God opened doors for Jesse to find a job. It's really kind of God was orchestrating every step of our way for the next move, and so we stayed. In 2008, they were looking for a person from the Campus Crusade for Christ in Switzerland. Uh, to lead a leadership ministry in Geneva. So I had no idea what uh, that was, what does that really mean. I applied for a position in one of the organizations, which is a very good organization, but it is ecumenical. And so I was told that, oh, this is very liberal and ecumenical. I said, if the Lord wants me to be there, to be a redeeming influence, why not? So I applied for a good position for evangelism, world evangelism. And there were 398 applications from all over the world. And they shortlisted two people. One was uh, South Korean, the other one was me. So it was like 50 50. I, I mean, the beginning of 2000, the end of 2007, God clearly spoke to us that He will open the doors and find a way for us for our, for our calling and work. So I thought this is the organization through which I can really uh, do my work. But, <clears throat> having all the interviews and everything done and finally they come to me saying that they have chosen this in South Korea. Uh, whereas I was told that, you know, absolutely I'm doing fine in interview and I will get this job. Well, making the story short, um, later on I came to know they took the South Korean because Ban Ki-moon, the, uh, you know Ban Ki-moon, the Secretary General of the United Nations, the one at the time, so he was from South Korea, so it was kind of political and stuff like that. So it was disappointing. And that was the time Jesse wrote a letter, find out Campus Crusade, and the leader was Hans Peter Neusch uh, from uh, the national director and asking for a job if there is something. And so, so I was there and uh, that's what he told me, there is a ministry in Geneva. Many people tried twice or three times to start something, nothing is working. So we are looking for someone, and he didn't say that you are the person, but would you like to come? We have a meeting in Geneva with other leaders to find out how to go about it. So I was there, I was only the different one with a different color and a young guy at the time. And so uh, waiting for the Lord to, I mean, I was fascinated about Geneva. The statistics about Geneva was impressive. It has this major United Nations presence with 10,000 staff. It has uh, um, 15 uh, UN agencies. It has 25 intergovernmental organizations and uh, 100 and, uh, sorry, uh, 250 plus NGOs at the time and 569 multinational companies and then 193 mm -hmm. member states and people speaking 200 plus languages or living and working in Geneva. And Decisions made in Geneva does make a world impact. I mean, it's a city of reformation. It's a city of influence, powerful. So it's, uh, it's like it's the gateway to connect with all the nations. Imagine, it's really the hub. It's like the day of Pentecost where the all nations were affected. That's the place, the nerve center of Switzerland. I said, Lord, it's really amazing. Wow, this is really great. And I was just waiting, and of course there were senior people who were, <coughs> who can lead this ministry, but finally at the end of the day they said, Benji, God is calling you for such a ministry. Are you willing to lead this work? Um, I said, okay, yeah, that's fine. I mean, I didn't say, okay, sorry. It was very, and I didn't understand what does it mean. I have no experience of, I mean, this is the ministry to serve the community of ambassadors and members of parliament and the UN diplomats to spur, serve them spiritually and professionally. So I know that I have qualifications. I know I'm very relational. I was very confident with relationally when I have to talk to people and do things. So I said, with humility, I said, yes. So we went to the, later on, we went to the US and uh, to Washington DC and other countries to see how they are doing for the past 40 years. But on the way back, God was, I mean, I felt that the spirit of the Lord speaking, telling Benji, Geneva is not Washington DC or New York or London, Geneva is Geneva. 
I really wanted to go and then reach out. I thought I would go and talk to ambassadors, bring them to Christ, and turn the world upside down. This was so passionate. But for the first three months, it was absolutely nothing. Not even a single contact. No one. It was like what I witnessed that day sitting in the room in Geneva, like uh, witnessing to firework. And now I'm seeing what happens after the firework. You know, smoke and uh, you know, smell and there is nothing happening. <clears throat> I said, Lord, what's happening? I mean, I, I want to go and reach out to these people. But I tell you, the Lord brought me to the altar, to the place to make me realize that Benji, Jesus, uh, I mean, to realize that without Jesus, I can do nothing. I know that without Jesus, I can do nothing, but in my being, this humbling myself was necessary because it was not about me. It's about the Lord and his word. So that's how it started. Uh, uh, well, uh, I just prayed and then my, the God opened doors. It's, I tell you, till 2008, till today, God has opened amazing doors, amazing doors. I can go on to tell many testimonies. Maybe I can tell two uh, and then in the next session, I want to talk to you something very concrete about the leadership principles. But since uh, you have requested me to share my testimony, so I'm just sharing a little bit of that. Um, I have to tell you the first contact that God gave um, me was, uh, there was a call, it was a Sunday, you know, and with, with campus, it's like the Y1, we do have to send newsletters to us ask people to become our ministry partners, support our work and all those things. So we were staying in Freeburg for many years and all my contacts were the German speaking Swiss people. So I sent my letters to all of them and we moved to uh, Lausanne after seven years of staying in Freeburg. That is the French speaking part of Switzerland and we didn't have any connection there. And uh, one Sunday I was there, a call, I got a call and there was a gentleman saying, I'm Dr. Dr. Tony UKT and I'm from the World Health Organization and they said Dr. Benjamin Levy Moses. I said yes. He said I, I got your newsletter. I was really surprised and how did he get my newsletter? I didn't send anyone in the French speaking part and he is a very senior, uh, the, uh, sorry, uh, medical professional, uh, ophthalmologist who was uh, uh, the main architect to find vaccination for river blindness in Africa. Yeah. So he said, and the reason I'm calling you was uh, um, your name, uh, I mean, under your name, you have put the place that you live in. That's Renault. It's very close to where we lived, uh, where we lived previously. And there was his teacher who taught him in Congo, a Swiss lady. Her name is Monique Melon. So he picked up the phone by any chance that if she would know. But imagine the Listen here, we just moved um, for maybe a week or a month, we don't know, I mean, very new, nobody we know in the French part. And he picks up the phone and he tells that, by the way, do you know this gentleman, Benjamin Levy Moses? And she said, yeah, I know him, he preached in our church this morning. So it was really, uh, absolutely, just that Sunday, that was my first Sunday in Los Angeles preaching, and this lady was there, and he called, and there was a connection, and then he called me, to come and meet. Then the other thing that I already told you, the three problems, you know, they asked the Lord to show the disconnected group, the disoriented group, and the kingdom leaders. So I'm not going to tell that, but God taught something very interesting. The kingdom ways are very different than the worldly ways. Because we have certain principles, values, we can learn many lessons, but everything works beautifully through relationship. Whether you to love God or love your neighbor or loving others, Everything falls in place through relationship. It is a beautiful thing. You know, I was asked the first assignment that if I would like to lead a Russian diplomat's Bible study group. I said, <laughs> yes, of course. And they said, but warning, there are many people who led before not anyone survived more than six weeks. They are very tough people and very strong opinionated and they would, I said, it's okay. So I was going there and I said, Lord, please, uh, you know, I, everybody in tie and suit and uh, these are diplomats. And that guy who was sitting next to me, he was not a diplomat. And then he said that, you know, uh, he was uh, in prison for many years. I said, why? And he killed two or three people, I mean, before coming to Geneva. Man, God was, 
kind of telling me this is the international community. It's not like, okay, we want to ambassadors and everything is colorful and beautiful and go and sit next to them and talk to them. No, it is God who is exposing me to the condition of the human heart. So I was leading this Bible study group. I have to tell you, it was very nice. But these guys, sometimes when you quietly lead them and say something, the guy stands up, he bangs the t table and he will say, now you stop and listen to me. This is how exactly they say. And then you listen to them and they ask questions. But there is nothing in their heart. That's the way how they express. I took a Swiss friend of mine. He was sitting at the edge of the table. He thought there is going to be a war breaking out at any, <laughs> any moment. So this is the kind of a group. I tell you, once we were sitting like this and I was teaching, the guy walks in. And he is a Russian. Obviously, he doesn't belong to this group. We are all in a tie and suit. And he walks in a young guy, needle pick, drug addict. Somebody said there is a Russian group, so he came to this group. And uh, I, as a leader, I'm responsible for the group. So the right thing for me that I had to do the protocol says, or whatever the protocol is, please, sorry, this is for uh, the Plumax Bible Study Group. And I could have, you know, made this guy to go away in a gentle way. But I did unusually something. This Sometimes I make some divine mistakes. This is one of them, and there were many others I did. I pulled a chair and I said, please sit down. None of these guys liked what I did. They were frowning, they were angry, but they couldn't say it. They said, how dare you make a drug addict to sit among us? This was literally how they expressed with their eyes. I mean, I'm reading and nobody was listening to what I was saying. They were really obviously angry. And of course, I understand. I stopped everything. I told this gentleman, the young guy, I said, tell me what's your name? He said, I'm Artimon. And, uh, and he was, uh, I said, tell about yourself a little bit and why did you come here? He stood up, he was really dozing off and, and then he said, you know, I'm 24 years old and this and that. And then he started to tell his story. I'm from Russia, I come from an Orthodox family. And then he said, when I was a young boy, my mom left to be with a man in Germany and uh, the father was uh, an alcoholic and he died and the uncle was abusive which was very depressing to hear his story and he was exposed to drug mafias at a very young age and but he he was telling this story and he was also telling that how he knows the lord every time he ended up in prison he used to cry out to the lord lord please save me and then he comes out of the prison but nowhere to go and he ends up again with the drug mafias so i was writing down in the paper all the bible verses you know what I should tell him, God can heal him. There is absolutely not, you know, nothing is impossible with God. No addiction is impossible. All those things I was writing down. And he finished talking. Nobody was really, uh, you know, kind of listening in that sense. Uh, they were even very upset. Why did I not make him to speak? So he, he, he finished speaking and he told his story. And then I just wanted to read what I have written to tell that Lord is able to heal him. But I really could feel very strongly in my spirit, just put it down. And I did something very unusual. I just put this one down. I went to him and I just hugged him. And uh, I don't know why I did, but I just did it. I hugged him, but he was, he put his head on my shoulder and he was crying. He was crying for a long time. And everyone in the room, all these guys, they almost had everybody tears in their eyes. I mean, these are all tough Russian diplomats. Moment of silence. Absolutely nobody was speaking anything. I didn't say a word and then we sat. And of course, um, the diplomats, they said, Benji, you have spoken to us many times. And, but this was the time where we really felt God's presence in a very powerful way. So God was, uh, I mean, of course, later, um, this guy later on, he, he came to our group once or twice and then he went to a rehab and then he is now going to a church in France. And God has kind of healed him. I'm not saying my hug healed him, but it was a place where he could really find comfort. So we need to understand God's ways of how do we minister to people. And now it doesn't mean that now I'm going and hugging all the drug addicts in Geneva, but there are times where you need to really understand the ways of God and how 
do you engage and express in a natural way that comes so beautiful. So that's one story. And one that is one last story. I have some more time. So let's see. And that's how then, then the ministry started to develop. I mean, we started to set up hope teams for the Bible study group for diplomats. We started to round tables, think tanks, set up the Geneva Institute for Leadership and Public Policy, which we partner with them. And then we also uh, have uh, several other events like Ambassadors Business Connect. God was making things grow in a very organic way. And we have, in, uh, when we did the Ambassadors uh, Christmas Banquet, we had 80 of them and more than 40 ambassadors were present there. Incredible, this is North Korea, Iran, uh, Israel, America, all this country's ambassadors coming in one group, listening to the gospel message of Jesus. Mm. And this is not, you would never see, you know, I attend the Human Rights Council of the United Nations every year. And of course, every country is seated based on the alphabetical order. But they would never talk, I mean, like, I don't want to mention them, countries that are really in opposition, they would never talk to each other. But if you come to our event, these people have the opportunity to connect and talk. They can't, because this is not a political event, this is an event that's very neutral. But usually they don't go to such events, these people, but they come to our event because of the visibility and credibility that God has given to our event, uh, I mean to our organization, uh, Global Leadership Chani Baba. I'll tell you one story. This is about uh, the uh, when we first did uh, the ambassador's dinner event in Geneva. I had no idea whom to invite. So we had a delegation from Canada. My counterpart had brought a member of parliament and uh, he said, Benji, could you please organize a uh, dinner event for ambassadors? I said, of course. So I invited all the ambassadors to come. And this is clearly an evangelistic Christian event. And we need to be very careful that, you know, you can't be churchy in the way how you engage and talk to these people. Then they would never come. You know, the moment they come and then they hear something and they know, okay, this is something very, this is kind of a religious stuff and it is not for me. So you need to really bring in uh, the gospel in a seasonal way, in an excellent way in your presentation. And the more important thing is that they need to see your heart that you are there to serve and uh, not to, uh, you know, um, kind of take advantage uh, or, or go with any Western interest. These people see the most influential people are the least rich group and they are the most lonely people. So we reached out to these people and who comes for this event? There were many ambassadors and one ambassador in particular, I don't want to mention the country name. He was the chairman of the Arab League. It's a very senior position and he kept, he comes to the event. I was very excited and I said, the Excellency, thank you for coming. But I didn't know how then, the, you know, what to, what he would think. But he came with the security guards and everyone. And then he said, Dr. Moses, I just came here to just to say thank you. I'm not going to stay for the event. And he drove all the way from Bern to come to Geneva. That's like two and a half hours and uh, to say thank you for the invitation. So I was really deeply touched that he had the courtesy to come and say thank you. Um, but he said, I have other meeting to go, but I wanted to come and say thank you. And then he, he exchanged business cards. And then what I did was, before he said uh, he had to leave, I just said, Excellency, he said, okay, I pray for you. And of course, he said, please. Then I did pray for him and he was deeply touched. So what he did was, uh, he said, where is your office? Uh, I said, I have an office in Lausanne, but I work with people like you in Geneva at the United Nations. Then he said, I will write back, I write to you so we could meet. And he went and then three months, no email from him. I was just thinking, should I a little bit nudge him? And then, you know, and then I felt, no, I shouldn't do that. If he, he's a busy guy. And uh, so I left it to the Lord and I said, whenever it happens, it happens, it's okay. So I was sitting at one of the United Nations agencies. We have the Bible study group. Before I go, I was sitting at the reception. A gentleman walks by and he comes to me and he puts his arms around me and he says, Oh, Dr. Moses, you know, how are you doing? I was thinking, oh, I've seen him somewhere. Who is this guy? I couldn't really recollect. And immediately and I realized that he is the chairman of the Arab League, this man. And uh, he said, I'm sorry I didn't write to you because I was extremely busy and traveling. Do you have time this week if you're there 
tomorrow I'm going to be in Geneva. Can we have lunch together? So my agenda was open and I said yes. And so we had lunch. So the conversation was going on in this way that it was all formal thing. He was telling about how he was an ambassador in uh, Jordan, uh, in you know, Washington DC, in India, in many countries. And then uh, we all talked about everything was on the countryside. And then he asked about what I do as an organization. I said what I do, we are a Christian organization serving the community of pastors and parliamentarians and so on. So, then I said, uh, Excellency, we are doing a conference. That's the Nation Building Conference Policy Institute. And this year it's going to be on the conflict resolution. Would you like to come and share a few words? And he said, uh, who are the participants? I said people, government ministers, cabinet ministers, and people like that who come at a very high level. So, and then he said, how many minutes you can, uh, I will have to speak. I said, I can give you three minutes. So he said, okay, then I will come to speak was very happy. Where is the conference? It's in Geneva, the United Nations. So everything was fixed, but just a few weeks before the conference, I heard that the person who was booking the conference center of the United Nations booked for the wrong date. So we don't have the venue now. The venue has to be moved to France in the chateau. Man, that's like for him from going to the chateau, sorry, from Geneva to the chateau to go on back and forth, it's like five to six hours and to speak for three minutes. So I was very uh, embarrassed and then I called him. I have to say that I'm sorry that we made a mistake and uh, you know, we booked for a wrong date and it's not there, but we are having it in a chateau in France. And uh, I said, but it would be an honor if you still could come. And he said, I will call you back. And then he calls me and he says, I gave a word to you, Dr. Moses, I want to come. Send me the coordinates. I did everything. Just the day before the conference, he calls me and he says, how are you going to go to this place? I said, I'll go by my car. He said, why don't you bring your car, put it in my embassy, and we can go together. Oh. So that's a nice thing. I mean, we prayed a lot, Jesse and I, my wife and I. Uh, and then I know that six hours or five hours of the car is not going to push me out. It's a beautiful time. We can have good conversation, open conversation. So we go there, and on the way, he didn't say much. He did give an excellent speech for three minutes on the topic. And then I came back with him. He asked Dr. Moses, how was my speech? I said, Excellency, it was really great. He said, explain that to me. What do you mean? So I told him what I felt and everything. He was very deeply touched. And then he said to me, uh, he told me and he said, he said, Dr. Moses, you seem to be a person who cares for leaders. I said, that's what we are there for. We have to serve you. And, uh, and then he said, please call me uh, by his first name. You know, usually ambassadors, would not allow anyone. I mean, that's the protocol by calling anybody by name. You always call Excellency. Sometimes it may take 10 years or 15 years of a friendship, and then they say, you can call by my first name. Some countries, I know Belarus was one ambassador I know, <laughs> who did a ceremony to allow other person to call him by first name. This is the world that they live in, really. So he was very quick. Okay, I can call his name Abraham, okay? So um, she said, please call me Abraham. And uh, I said, please call me Benji. And uh, then he was very happy. And he said, Benji, how is your schedule for today? Do you have some time? I said, I'm all for you. He said, would you like to come to my home for a lunch? Mm -hmm. And uh, it's a late lunch. And I said, it will be my pleasure. So he calls his wife and he says, I, I have a friend, Benji. He will come and have lunch with us today. So. We go back, the driver parked the car. It's a huge, huge house, a mansion with the two swimming pools, three maids. And, and those of you listening from India here, there is no concept of maid in Switzerland. You don't have people, we need to do our job and that's how it works. But here they, they have three maids and a huge house. But as soon as I got up the car, I just prayed a prayer in my heart. I said, Father, even as I break bread with this dear family, let Jesus be seen in all my conversation and everything I say, and I do. Because for me, breaking bread is very spiritual, very precious, and very important. And so I have never broken bread with a Muslim ambassador's family before. Go to the house, man, his wife came to greet me, and then there was a huge table. That's like 30 different dishes. And uh, he gave me this honor to sit in the center, and he said, please, have food. 
So I had no idea where to start from the left or from the right or the middle or, you know, and I was really confused about how to go about it. But then first thing I did, I said, uh, Ambassador Abraham, is it okay I uh, pray for the meeting? He said, please. And I did pray. So every time I prayed, he was deeply moved. Something was going on. So we finished eating, we finished our conversation, and then in the, we went to the hall, and then we were standing and talking. And he said, Benji, I'm a proud father of five daughters. Mm -hmm. And uh, he said, one is in Canada, one is in the UK, the third one and third, and the rest of them are here in Switzerland. And as he was speaking, there was a girl that came into the room. And I had no idea what was going on. She came screaming and making too much noise, running around, hitting her head against the wall and so much noise. So for me, like, I didn't know what was going on. And he immediately he said, uh, Benji, I'm sorry. This is my fourth daughter. She's 16 years old. I will give her a name. I called her Sarah. Sarah is 16 year old and she's highly autistic and she cannot recognize people and she needs attention 24 hours because she's highly autistic. And I was really concerned because I thought that she's going to break her head. She was running around screaming. And then as she was doing this, he turned to her and he said, Sarah, say hello to my friend Benji. I was just thinking, how would she say hello? Because she can't recognize people. She needs attention all the time. She's highly autistic, but he doesn't even know why he said. He was casually saying, and she didn't mind. She was running around. And the second time, Sarah say hello to my friend Benji. She didn't care. And the third time, again, during the casual conversation, he casually said, Sarah, say hello to my friend Benji. She came suddenly and she stood in front of me, looking at me and smiling, very calm, composed. I didn't know what was going on. <laughs> and then she took hold of my hand and she kissed my hand. I had absolutely don't know what to do with it because in the Swiss, you know, we have the three way how you greet people. So, having, having done this, I didn't know how to respond to this, you know. So what I did was I, quite, I was very quiet and then the ambassador said, Benji, take hold of her hand and kiss back. So I did that. And then she went to her room and I saw the ambassador and his wife, they were crying. I had no idea. I was thinking, what did I do and why they are crying? I have no. And then the ambassador said, Benji, we are, we've been her parents for 16 years. Never once that she did such a thing to anyone, including us, who were the first person she's doing such a thing. And I was really deeply moved. And then he said something, there must be something very special in you. I want to jump and say, yeah, that's Jesus. I didn't say anything. I was very quiet. I was deeply moved. So. And then our friendship grew. You know, they used to come to my home and we go to their home. And uh, once I was in London and I came back from London after there was a conference where they invited me to speak at the parliament. And then I came back and um, I was going to Lausanne to our office. I was in the car and he called me and he said, Benji, where are you these days? I said, I've been traveling. He said, um, my wife has come back from my country. You know, I have to tell you this. He said one thing when this incident happened that day. He said, Benji, in Islam, when such thing happens, like a girl born with such a deformity, we consider it as a curse from Allah and we put the child outside. But for us, she is our life. I mean, they are very precious people. Knowing that she has autism, they didn't know what autism was. When she was five years old in, uh, in uh, Jordan, they came to know she was shattered. And she went and did a special studies in autistic studies to take care of her daughter. And being a woman, she set up the first autistic center in her country to take care of autistic children. Wow. So that's an incredible family there. And so here he says, where are you? My wife has come back and she got some gifts for you and your children. I said, I'm coming on Monday. And uh, I go to my oh. office. I said, wow, I need to take a nice gift for this family. So in my mind, I was thinking all the big gifts that I can take Swiss chocolates. And I go to my office, uh, campus office in Lausanne, and on the table, I mean, I prayed the prayer. I said, Lord, please help me. I would like to take a good gift. On the table, I had a colleague of mine who works for the Arab Outreach. 
she had written, a, she had put a nice gift on my table with a post-it that says, Benji, if you're planning to give a gift, a uh, uh, good gift for somebody who speaks Arabic, this is the best gift. Oh, Man, this was okay. awesome. Just now I prayed and here is the answer. Mm -hmm. But I just picked up the gift. I said, no, Lord, not this. This was an Arabic Bible. For me, it was too quick. I was thinking of a chocolate and here was the Arabic Bible. I was confused. Is it from the Lord or is it from Satan? But then why would Satan want you to give the Bible? It's not a bomb. So all this kind of a conversation in my mind. But anyways, I took it home and then Jesse and me and Jesse said, honey, you prayed for a gift and God has given. Take it with you. So I tell you, yesterday I told the story a little bit in between. This is what happened. I prayed and then Monday, taking this to his home. That day from going from Lausanne to Geneva was really like feeling that going through the valley of shadow of death. What if they reject? What if they don't accept? What if, what if, what if? All these things. That's where the Spirit, I felt the Holy Spirit ministering to my heart saying, Benji, this was not about you. And this is never, this is not about you now. It was not about you in the past. And it will be never about you in the future. Mm -hmm. That was very comforting to know, but it was not easy. I go there, his wife says, Benji, this is for you. This is for Steve. This is for Chris. All the gifts. And my mind was telling, look at you, what you're going to give. I told my mind to shut up. And I uh, just opened the bag. I took the gift and I said, I have something very precious to give to you. This is a Bible. And uh, she opened it and she said, wow, it's written in Arabic. I said, yes. And they started to read. But making the story short, we came to India. This was some years ago, actually. We came went to India, six weeks, we come back. I switched, put my Swiss SIM and then I put it on my mobile. There were like 25 or so missed calls from the ambassador. I thought this is not a good sign. I called him back immediately. He said, is everything okay? And he said, no. I said, what happened? It's about Sarah. What happened to her? She had a big accident. She was in a special autistic bus from Geneva to Neon, and the driver forget to close the door in the highway and she slipped and fell off the bus in the highway, 120 kilometers per hour. So she was badly hurt, completely, you know, broken face, teeth, everything. And uh, she said, ben, he said, Benji, please come, please come. I said, I just came. There is a conference that's going to happen in our organization. That's the transfer of leadership with Campus Crusade. Three days. They invited all the national directors to come for an internal conference. They invited me too. I'm not, I'm not a national director, but they invited me as well. I said, I will go to the conference and then I will come to you. And he said, no, Benji, please come. You would never force me. Then I, this is again a divine mistake. I, I don't, I do some divine mistakes sometimes. This is another one. I said, why don't you come to Zurich for this conference? I didn't really mean that he would say yes. And he immediately said, yes, I'm coming with my wife. And he kept the phone. I said, no, oh, Lord. I mean, he had never been to a Christian conference, concert, no idea. Absolutely, they're Muslims. And he has to come for three days and sit with the Campus Crusade Conference, the national directors telling what Jesus is doing in their country. It's completely difficult. I don't know what he <coughs> did. I made a big mistake. So now I am using my diplomatic mind to convince them they should not come. <laughs> I took the phone and I said, I gave 10 reasons. I said, Pastor Abraham, thank you so much for allowing to, that you want to come and your wife, you're very happy for that. But I have to tell you something. He said, what? I said, this is a Christian conference. He said, okay. And you would not understand the language. He said, not in English. No, no, it's in English, but it is very religious language. And then I gave like one, two, three, four reasons. And I thought at the end he would say, okay, Benji, in this case, I'm not coming. After I finished saying, he said, Benji, what's wrong with you? You're my friend. We want to come. Oh, my Jesus, I don't know what to do. I kept the phone. Now I have to convince campus crusade people. I'm bringing the chairman of the Arab League to a conference that's technical. I called my national director. He's such an amazing man. And he said, Benji, bring them. We keep a low key. We don't tell anyone. And for the first time, they came to Zurich. They sat there for three days. Honestly, that was the conference. I never heard anything. I never could hear a song, never could hear what people were speaking. Yeah. My focus was absolutely on them. <laughs> I was praying, Lord, please let nobody speak bad about Islam or say something bad, <laughs> you know, stupid things. And uh, she was covered up and all those things. Nobody asked them the question. But in between, they will walk away and they will come back. So I was not knowing what was really going on with these people. And afterwards, you know, after the after three days, 
um, there was a big transfer of leadership in Lutzen with like some 5,000 people coming and uh, everything, music, concert and all those things. They finished and then from Lutzen to Geneva, we were in the crowded train. I'll finish in five minutes. He told, uh, it was a crowded train. That's him, his wife, Jesse, that's my wife and me. He told Benji, I had been to thousands of conferences. You know, he had been three times the chairman. And he said, and the ambassador, he said, Benji, but this was the first time that it deeply moved us. He said, the songs you people sang, the love that you showed, and the words spoken, everything was so deeply moving and overwhelming that we had to walk away, sometimes cry, and we came back. Wow. So I'm getting the reason for why they walked away. I thought they are not liking it. And then his wife, in the crowded train, she took hold of my wife's hand and she said, in my heart, I believe that Jesus is Lord. Wow. Three times in my heart, I believe that Jesus is Lord. So it was really an amazing experience. You are not experiencing this conversion experience in the church. Mm -hmm. It's in the crowded train mm -hmm. and they are confessing and telling something, a divine thing happening. And then he told something very moving. He said, Benji, ever since you came to my home and gave this Bible, I was so happy he's going to, this is a great breakthrough. I was expecting something great. He said, we started to read the Bible. Everything went wrong. My daughter's accident and he had to quit his job as an ambassador. I was looking for you, were not there. And then he <coughs> told something. He said, everything was too much. I could not take it. I looked for you, you were not there. And I came to a place there where I had to quit. He was talking about his life to commit suicide. His wife heard this and then she couldn't contain. She started to tear up and she started to cry. And he is such a senior man telling this. And he said, I want to quit. I want to put the house in order. But he said, I want to go to visit my daughter for one last time. And before I quit, he goes to sleep and he has a dream. And in his dream, exactly he sees what he had mission to do to go and visit his daughter. So in his dream, he goes and sees his daughter. His daughter looked at him and then he caressed her and said, you know, she was in the hospital. And then he kissed her goodbye. And then he said uh, to her, Sarah, um, this is the last time you will see daddy and you will not see me anymore. And he said these words to her and, uh, and then he kissed her goodbye. When he was about to walk, he said that she just reached out and took hold of his hands. And uh, then she opened her mouth and said something. She said, Daddy, please don't leave me. You know, when he said this, he burst into tears. He said, I never heard my daughter's voice. Yeah. You see, she's autistic. And he said, she cried, Daddy, don't leave me. So he decided not to leave. Well, anyways. Um, and like um, they, I mean, he is in, still in Geneva with his wife and children and they come to us and we read the Bible, we pray. At some point he goes back to his country and he could potentially become the next prime minister of his country. Wow. Imagine with Jesus in his heart mm -hmm. and uh, what impact that could make for his nation. So that's tip of an iceberg, a little bit of a work and the testimony. Mm -hmm of God's faithfulness. Mm -hmm. One last word, so Ephesians says that God is able to do much more than you could ask or imagine according to the power that is worked within you. But is there anything a man cannot imagine? Tell me. We can imagine anything, isn't it? I can imagine to be God. Nobody can stop that. But it says that God is able to do much more than you could ask or imagine. That's what it's. I see that in my life too. When my parents had this vision, God will take me to be nations, to be a blessing. I had no idea. All my life I was thinking when I was a child, what food I would eat. I was so hungry, literally. There is, apart from food, I didn't know much, many things. But that's the way how God leads his people. There are many things that I learned. There are seven key principles that I learned through my life just quickly. Or maybe I'll start with this when we come back yeah. and then I will go to the next session. So thank you for your patience and God bless you. We will see you in another half an hour. Yes. Yeah, we <laughs> yes, welcome back. Um, so I think there is Kochi and then uh, there is uh, the from Kochi. Yeah. Okay, good. So I was just sharing my testimony this morning and uh, 
I want to share some of the key principles and lessons that I have learned as growing up. Now, sometimes we do get some motivational speeches and stuff like that, and we see, wow, we are so excited and we think we can do that. Well, it's a journey. Like it was, uh, Usain Bolt is coming and telling, oh, you can also win Olympic gold medals. And we get very inspired by that, but it's not just he just got it in one day. Sometimes it's with the Christian walk, we try to think that Christian life is all about honey and no bees. You see, it, it, it is hard work. It is a process. Growth is a process. We need to, we can't negate that. And uh, it's important for us to understand how we naturally grow. And God does not, you know, God does not go against our common sense, but he goes beyond our common sense for us to understand certain things. Mm -hmm. But there is a natural way of how things are ordained and how God created Everything is beautifully structured and organized and functioning in the natural world, how God created it. So we need to understand that. So that's what the journey is important, how God shapes and, and he works in our lives and destines us to accomplish his purpose. It's not for one fine day that we do something and we become great. Everything is part of the calling of our life from our birth until what is happening and what would happen until the end. So we should never forget and it. Of course, we could be ambitious about thinking about the future for something, a project or something that you want to accomplish, but we should not forget the journey and to enjoy the time that God has given us here on this earth. And through relationship, how do you build that? It's very important. So here, these are the seven uh, kingdom citizen qualities or seven key principles that I learned. One is identity and calling. That's something I learned is don't live in the shadow of other success but live in the light of eternity, and that's your calling. So my identity, my identity is established in relationship to God and others. Identity is not in yourself, you know. There is no identity and meaning in myself, Benji. My identity comes only in my relationship to God and my relationship with people. Do you agree that? Otherwise, yes. Is that the first point you said, identity and calling? Yes. Thank you. Yeah, and so not to live in the shadow of other success because we are all unique in which God created us for a purpose. Mm -hmm. And we need to understand the understand the purpose of why God created us and to live in the light of eternity. Because sometimes we tend to lie, live in the light of the moment of what <clears throat> we see. But always to have this eternal perspective is very important to grow in that. Second one, faithfulness and integrity. And one thing I learned is to be faithful in little things. How do you give your time, your talents, your treasures, your relationship, and so on? It's, it's a small thing that makes the difference. You see the time you spend with people, drink coffee, or clean, and this, and these are all important things. Our culture has trained our, our mind to think that something big where people will notice you and make an impact is what a great thing. But like you get like 100,000 likes and a YouTube video or something, then you are becoming great. That's not the greatness that how God sees us and the way how we engage and relate and respond and to live our lives in relationship with him and in relationship to others is what matters a lot. So give your time. Sometimes we measure wealth based on money. We measure wealth based on success. But as I said yesterday, success is based on fruitfulness, not based on how big your house is, how big your car is. Of course, God can take care of our needs. He does. He says, seek first God's kingdom and his righteousness and everything he gives for which we need. But sometimes in our culture, we put the materialistic thing as the center focus and everything is centered around it and that's a problem. And then comes the individualism, then comes everything else surrounded by that. So we alienate ourselves and we become the God of ourselves. So we see the world through our eyes and me in the center. That's not how Bible sees us. Just, it comes with God and in relationship to one another. It's a beautiful thing. It's a wonderful image. And then time is very precious. How do you give your time? What do you do with your time? And sometimes we think that doing your, you know, time is well spent with relationship. is well creating, uh, created for eternity. And how do we use our talents for empowering others, to bless others? How do we use our treasure, that's our money, it's altogether a different subject to talk about. And then, of course, our relationship that God has given us, relationship within the family, friendship, and also among the neighbors or 
you know, your community, your school, wherever you are. And these are the wealth that we have. They are very precious. We need to treasure. But sadly, we tend to look to people who are high position and people who have influence so we get some benefit out of it. But we should never forget that in relationship, what God has already given us, whether it's husband, wife, children, or father, mother, all those kind of things are great wealth. And we should treasure those things very preciously. And the third one is conviction and courage. Stand firm in faith, which is rooted in the truth. Not to be wishy-washy. If you don't stand for something, you fall for everything. And God's word is ultimate truth. It's subjective truth. And everything should be based on that. And God's word and his love is important. If you don't stand, as I said, for something, you fall for everything. So conviction and courage. I think it was G.K. Chesterton who said that uh, tolerance is the virtue of a man without convictions. He talks so much about tolerance. Of course, we need to be tolerant. But at the same time, it should be an objective tolerance, not be subjective. When we don't have a truth as such, and when it is truth becomes subjective, then we can define truth based on what we think and how we feel. I feel certain ways, so I think that this is what I am. But that doesn't really make it a truth. When it is objective, then we can analyze that, okay, based on these principles and values, I'm wrong. But today, when people talk about truth as subjective, so every truth matters, and that is not truth at all. You see, so I have rights to exercise my freedom based on my feelings, what I think, and this is what I am. And you also have the base uh, freedom to do whatever you can do with your feelings. And your feelings may be there to attack me or whatever you know you want to do, and you can do it. So everybody is doing what they think is right, but everybody is wrong. So that's what it's conviction is important in this age and time. And then the courage to move forward with your conviction. It may be called as nuts or people, I mean, the story of David and Goliath is so beautiful. It was not just the moment when David hit the uh, hit with the stone uh, and killed Goliath, it was the matter. No, it's a journey. And in every journey, he has exhibited faith, standing before kings, standing before the army, standing before his own family members. It was not easy. No encouragement, no motivation, nothing. Absolutely from anyone. But he had his trust in the Lord and the confidence in the Lord in which he moved forward. So that's why it is. It is counterintuitive, countercultural, the kingdom values all. But we need to be firm and we need to move forward. And then fourth, work with integrity and excellence. Keep your best at what you do. Work with creativity, stand with conviction and go with courage, putting your faith into action. Whatever you do, do it all for. Yeah, for the glory of God, that's very important. That's the fifth point, for his glory. Whatever you do, do it as God's glory. I mean, whatever means whatever. It doesn't mean whatever nonsense we do. It's whatever we do according to God's will as to be for his glory. You understand? Even if you're cleaning the toilet, do it well. It's, it's really, I mean, do it as you are a steward of God. If you're cleaning anything, you're brushing your teeth, whatever you do, you are Christ ambassador. Yes. Incident to say when when we have shower or so many hair in this where you need to clean and it's disgusting and I also like God I think it's worship so let's dig that out so yeah you're right I mean it's these things nobody sees but yeah yeah, that, yeah. very good and see these are small yeah. things when we do it with with our heart. And in, in mindful of others to serve them and doing it is for his glory. And it is whether you drink water, whether you shower, whether you clean, whether you cook. It's beautiful. Like, for example, I do cook and I enjoy that. And for me, it's a spiritual act of worship. It's nice because people enjoy your food. Because sometimes we think that oh, food is nothing. I mean, it's for your stomach. No, I think we need to learn to understand and appreciate that what God has created and how we need to enjoy and cherish that everything is given mm -hmm. and to experience the joy in the fullness of what God has given us is very important. So work with integrity. That's important. See, somebody said success is what people see that you have, but integrity is something what people, uh, what you do when nobody is watching you. You see, 
when nobody is watching you, with nobody, no overseer, nobody, but you know this is the right thing to do and you do it because God is watching. It's not God is watching like a big brother wanting to pick your eyes and then, you know, poke you in your eyes. No, that's not the thing because he's sovereign and he loves us. And we need to have that kind of a genuine godly fear about the Lord and the way how we should be an ambassador of his kingdom. And sixth one is generosity. You see, giving is not an act of generosity, but it's the very nature of God. Sometimes rich people give one person or less than one person, and then they are famous. But it is giving not only money, as I said, giving your time, giving your talents, giving your treasures, the relationship, money, everything that matters. We don't give to become rich. We give because he has given himself to us. That is Christ in us, the hope of glory. That is the greatest rich that richness or the treasure that we have. That Christ in us, the hope of glory, that we can offer the world. That is that's an important thing we have to understand. And then, of course, that's what Paul says: treasures in the jars of clay. This is the message of the gospel. We are the jars of clay, feeble, fragile, easy to break. But yet, God holds this greatest mystery of all: that Christ in us, the hope of glory. Isn't it amazing? And that's the hope that we can offer to the people of the world, including ourselves. So that is amazing mystery and amazing truth. And it's not just, and of course, within that comes everything else. You understand? So within that comes everything else. So generosity. I told you the story of somebody invested in my life. And thus, now we are investing into 3,000 life and more. During the pandemic, we served 5,000 families. And you know, that's, it grows and multiplies. The kingdom principle is not two plus two is four. It's beyond that. It's beautiful. It's amazing. We should never calculate every, I mean, I'm not saying we should never calculate. It's good to be calculative. It's good to be, but we cannot limit what God has given us. Because God can do much more than we could ask and imagine. So that's important. And then the last one is fruitfulness. If our life does not produce the fruit of the spirit, then we are not successful people. That is true success lies in the fruitfulness. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, and all those things, self-control, and everything that comes. This is the, the you know, that's how uh, a tree is known by its fruit. So if your life produces, I mean, you know, don't always think in terms of me. It always in terms of, of course, me and us. How do we produce the fruit for God's glory? How do we live our lives? And that's very important for us to understand that. So this is, these are the seven principles in which uh, I just want to share. I'm going to give you some leadership lessons from the life of Nehemiah. And uh, it's something very interesting in a sense what we can learn. Um, Nehemiah chapter one, verses one to 11. Can somebody read quickly? What was the verse? Sorry. Nehemiah chapter 1, verses 1 to 11. 1 to 11. Chapter 1, verses 1 to 11. I got it. Okay, go for it. Words of Nehemiah, the son of Halakai. Now it happened in the month of Shizev, in the 20th year, as I was in Susa, the capital, that Hananiah. One of my brothers came with certain men from Judah, and I asked them concerning the Jews who had escaped, who had survived the exile, and concerning Jerusalem. And they said to me, the remnant there in the, pro in the province who had survived the, the exile is in great trouble and shame, while Jerusalem is broken down and its gates are destroyed by fire. As soon as I heard these words, I sat down and wept and mourned for days, and I continued fasting and praying before the God of heaven. And I said, the Lord God of heaven, the great and awesome God who keeps covenant and steadfast love with those who love him and keep his commandments. Let your ear, let your ear be attentive and your eyes open to hear the prayer of your servant that I now pray before you day and night. For the people of Israel, your servants, confessing the sins of the people of Israel, which we have sinned against you. Even I and my father's house have sinned. We have acted very corruptly against you, and I have not, have not kept the commandments, the statutes, and the rules that you commanded your servant Moses. 
Remember the word that you commanded your servant, Moses, saying, If you are unfaithful, I will scatter you among the peoples. But if you return to me and I keep my commandments and do them through, though your outcasts are in the outermost parts from, from heaven, from there I will gather them and bring them to the place that I have chosen to make my name dwell there. They are your servants and your people whom you have redeemed by your great power and by your strong hand. O Lord, let your ear be attentive to the prayer of your servant, and to the prayer of your servants who delight to fear your name. May success to your servant today and grant him mercy in the sight of his men. Now as I was now I was cut bare to you. Thank you so much, yes. You know, I before I start giving you that, I will give you seven key important leadership lessons we can learn out of it. But I all, want all of you to envision uh, what is the broken walls that you see, whether it's in your life or in your community, in your society and your nation. I and mean, here is a very clear lesson that, uh, or the, uh, you know, what we can learn uh, from the life of Nehemiah. I'm just going to explain that one. So. Think about broken walls. What does it resonate for you and where do you see? Of course, we keep complaining around the world that they see the problems, there is war, and my nation has this problem, there is persecution. So there are different broken walls and there are many broken walls that has to be built and to be bridged. So think of things like that and this will really help us to understand how to put things into perspective. So Nehemiah was a Jewish cupbearer to the Persian king in the fifth century BC. You know the role of a cupbearer? Okay, let me tell that quickly. In ancient times, a cupbearer was a trusted servant of a king or other high ranking official who was responsible for tasting and serving the wine and other beverages that were offered to the ruler or a guest. I mean, they do it for two reasons. One is the cupbearer was not only responsible for ensuring that the beverages were of good quality and safe to drink, but also for protecting the king from potential poisoning or other harm by making sure that no one tampered with the drinks. It's really you're taking your life at risk being a cup bearer. It's a huge responsibility as a cup bearer. I mean, uh, you have to take the brunt. I mean, take it up front and then if there was somebody poisoning the king, you drink and you die so the king knows that, okay, he's safe. Um, so it's a very highly um, huge responsibility to be a cupbearer. And as a trusted advisor and confidant of the king, the cupbearer also had access to sensitive information and was often involved in the affairs of the royal, royal court. It's not just simply we think, oh, he was a cook. It is a very high senior position that Nehemiah was holding. Understand? So he was a statesman. So he was a trusted confidant of the king. And he was also a trusted advisor to the king and played an important role in the rebuilding of Jerusalem wall and the restoration of the Jewish community following their exile in Babylon. A little bit of history there. So his leadership helped to rebuild the city walls of Jerusalem and re-establish the Jewish community worship and religious practices. His story provides both spiritual and practical leadership lessons that can be applied to our lives today. So it's not just something like 3,000 years ago it happened. It's very relevant for us even today. So here are those lessons. First, when you see a broken wall, when you see problems around you, when you see there is something deeply, something going <coughs> on, the first thing to do is what? What did Nehemiah do? Pray. That's important, yes, <laughs> prayer and fasting, prayer. Nehemiah's first response to the news of Jerusalem's broken wall was to pray. Pray is not just repeating some shopping list. It is practicing the presence of God in every area of your life. So he recognized that the situation was beyond his control and he needed divine intervention. So he knows that he can't do anything. His people can't do anything. They were in exile, nothing to do. So God is sovereign. Acknowledging the sovereignty of God and going to him is important. His prayer was an acknowledgement of God's sovereignty and a request for his favor and help. So there are five lessons we can learn from this. First one, recognize your limitation and seek God's help. So, you know, understand that we are a limited being. We can't be in control of everything. 
but we know that somebody is in control of everything. Who is that? God. God is in control. Like Nehemiah, we should recognize that there are some situations that are beyond our control. When we face such situations, our first response should be to turn to God in prayer and fasting. We should acknowledge that he is sovereign and that he had the power to intervene on our behalf. That's the first lesson. Second lesson, approach God with humility. I mean, this is a, within the prayer, there are five lessons I'm talking about. Approach God with humility. Nehemiah's prayer was marked with, by humility. It was poverty of spirit, recognizing the need of God. He acknowledged his own shortcomings and shortcomings of his people. That's what he did. When we approach God in prayer, we should do so with humility, recognizing our own weakness and limitations. It's very important. That's how God brings reformation or transformation. The third one, pray specifically. Not just blabbering and just saying something. Be very specific in your prayer. Nehemiah's prayer was specific. He asked God to grant him favor in the eyes of the king and to provide him with the resources he needed to rebuild the walls of Jerusalem. So this is, you see how specific he was? Very clear, he knew exactly what he wanted to do. So he's asking the Lord by being very specific, so we should do, when we pray, we should be specific about our prayer requests. We should ask God for exactly what we need. And of course, God does much beyond than what we ask for. But we need to be very clear, not beating about the bush and then say, oh, God will take care of it. Somehow he will make it happen. No, we need to be people who are intentional and who need to put things in perspective. And fourth lesson, pray persistently. You know, sometimes these lessons that I'm talking will have this kind of a reputation, but don't worry. Um, pray persistently. Nehemiah's prayer was not a one-time event. You see, he not just prayed once and said, okay, everything God will take care. He prayed continuously throughout the entire rebuilding process. When we pray, we should not give up if we do not see immediate results. We should continue to pray and trust that God will answer in his own time. So keep praying, be persistent in our prayer. Be faithful. That's very important. We cannot control God. It is the other way. We need to be under God's control. Sometimes people think by prayer we can control God and manipulate to make things do what, according to our desires and will. This is not the God of the Bible. We can never bend the will of the Lord according to our will, but we can submit to God's will and pray according to his will, things to be done. Is it clear? Good. And fifth lesson, trust in God's faithfulness. Nehemiah prayed, uh, prayer was answered in a remarkable way. God provided him with the resources he needed to rebuild the walls of Jerusalem. And when we pray, we should trust in God's faithfulness. We should have confidence that he will answer our prayers in the way that is best for us. He, that he knows what is best for us, even if it is not the way we expect. You get that? Sometimes when we pray and we don't get it, we feel very sad because our faith was in the object of our request and not in God in the first place. When we don't get what we ask for and when God doesn't give, even if we don't have that object what we ask for, but we still have God with us. You see, we are not sad, dissatisfied because we know God is good. Sometimes people put the faith in their prayer in the object of the request that they are asking for and they believe strongly that I will have it, I will have it, I will have it. And when they don't have it, then they get disappointed and everything goes wrong. I have a story to tell, but I don't want to get into the details of it. Some people think that you can manipulate faith to make things work, that this is not God's way of doing things. I had a friend in the Bible college who was very not, he was my age. I was 19 when I joined the Bible college. He was a powerful guy. He was, he comes from the state of Kerala. I mean, that's my neighboring state. And he was a man of God, really. I was a very playful guy, as I told you. So he will always come and say, Benji, you need to pray. You need to live to the Lord. You need to... He's a man of faith. And there was a guy who was possessed from uh, in the Bible college, really, literally. And they chained him to in the chapel. They, uh, you know, He was de really possessed by demon. And many people went to pray for him and nothing happened. But my friend who studied with me, uh, Martin his name, and he came to know and he goes there, he said, remove the chains. He goes and he hugs him and he says, in the name of Jesus, instantaneously, this guy was healed. So people know that Martin is a man of faith. Absolutely amazing things can happen. 
So everybody looked to him with that kind of a respect and reverence. And then we have the vacation in summer to go uh, home. And then when we come back for the next year, the news that I get, Martin passed away. I had no, we were shocked. What happened? And the story was this. Martin had a friend who was a Hindu. And this guy had a fail, love failure. He loved a girl. Something went wrong. And he took poison. And he was in the hospital in the verge of death. Martin goes there, shares the gospel, and he says, give your life to Christ. This guy accepts Christ, and then he says, you will not die. That's my word. You will not die. This is for God's glory. Absolutely confident everything. What happened? In a few days, this guy dies. Martin doesn't want to believe that. He says, God told me that you will not die, and you will not die. So this is for greater glory. He said, no funeral. Let's pray that God will raise him up. People are watching, and he prayed and prayed and prayed. Nothing happened. And people lost patience. They said, no, we can't keep the body for a long time. So they buried him. Martin did not want to come in terms with reality. So he goes to the tomb. Every morning, night, he stays there for one week, telling God, raise him up. You told me that he will not die. It will be for his glory. And raise him up. Nothing happens. So what Martin did, he was disappointed, dejected, and he took the same poison, and he committed suicide. This is a sad reality. Some people think that you can bend God's will to play according to your need. No. I'm not saying God cannot raise people. He does. But it, in this all, Martin was in the center of everything. He thought that he can control God. And he was the one who was playing the rules by his own books. But it didn't happen. That was a really came as a big shock to all of us. Mature faith believes in the supernatural power of God. That's what we believe, all of us. But that doesn't stop there. God is able to do it. He will able to. He is able to raise the dead, and you know everything. That is true. Mature faith believes in the supernatural power of God. But there are three things. But mature faith also bows to the sovereign purposes of God. We are not sovereign, but God is sovereign, and to and to surrender to His purpose is important. And the third thing, mature faith is based on the steadfast promises of God. God does not go against the promises of His word. So that is very important to be mature Christians, not blindly following some church and then they say, okay, if you believe in Christ, everything will be beautiful, everything will be great, everything. No, we need to understand the journey of being a Christian. Yes, please. Number three, mature faith is based on the steadfast promises of God. So, trusting in God's faithfulness, that's the fifth lesson. And the first one is prayer. Second one, planning. This is something we think, oh, this is for the business world, not for Christians. We Christians don't plan. We are only people who will do what, you know, we are just aligned by the Spirit and just wherever the Spirit takes, we will be there. Well, there is a truth in that. We are led by the Spirit of the Lord and we need to be there where the Spirit leads us. Planning is an essential part of our Christian life. Nehemiah not only prayed, but he also formulated a plan of action. He took the time to assess the situation, gather information, and develop a strategy to build the walls. This shows the importance of planning and preparation in achieving the goals effectively. I'm talking Bible here. I'm not talking about Quran or Bhagavad Gita or any other books from the Bible. So we need to open up our mind to understand how do we as Christians should live and engage in the world. So there are a few lessons some practical lessons on planning that we can learn from Nehemiah. First one, assess the situation. Before starting any projects or goals, it is essential to assess the situation. Nehemiah took the time to understand the conditions of the world, the resources available, and the challenges he might face. He helped him, this helped him formulate a realistic plan and set achievable goals. So that's very important to assess the situation. Second, gather information. Nehemiah did not rush into action without gathering all the necessary information. He consulted with experts, studied the terrain, and assessed the available resources. Gathering information helps you make informed decisions and avoid costly mistakes. Do you get that? Good. And third lesson, develop a strategy. Once Nehemiah had accessed the situation and gathered information, he developed a detailed plan of action. This plan included the material needed, the manpower required, and the timeline for completing the project, having a clear strategy 
helps you stay focused on and on track. Does it sound like being a Christian? Good. And the fourth lesson, appreciate challenges. Nehemiah knew that he would face opposition from the enemies of the Jew. He anticipated these challenges and developed strategies to overcome them. It is essential to anticipate challenges and plan for them to avoid getting sidetracked or discouraged. And fifth one, seek help. Nehemiah did not try to do everything on his own. He sought help from others, including the people of Jerusalem. To rebuild the walls, seeking help from others can make your task easier and also help you build relationships. So what was the first lesson we learned from Nehemiah's thing? Prayer. Second one? Planning. And the third one is perseverance. I talked a little bit about that, but I will tell a little bit more. Nehemiah faced many challenges and obstacles during the rebuilding process. We know that he was opposed by many enemies, and there were external threats from enemies, internal conflict among the people, and physical limitation due to the magnitude of the task, but he persevered and relying on God's strength and guidance. See, there are challenges everywhere. Life is not always easy and bed of roses. When God gives you a task to accomplish, it is a narrow way that we are called to walk. Maybe at the end I have to talk about the narrow way. Remind me, Joy. So, um, there are five lessons we can learn about perseverance. First one, set a clear goal and focus on it. Nehemiah had a clear goal in mind to rebuild the walls of Jerusalem. He focused on this goal and refused to be distracted by the challenges and obstacles that arose. In the same way, it is important to set a clear goal for yourself and stay focused on it. This helps you to prioritize your time and energy and work towards achieving your objectives, no matter what obstacles may arise. That's the first one. Second one, expect and plan for obstacles. Nehemiah knew that obstacles and challenges would arise, as I said, and he was prepared for them. He planned for contingencies and took steps to address potential problems before they occurred. So planning in advance is very important. Don't just wait for the last moment to think that something will just turn up. God does miracles, does miracles and wonders and signs. But as I said, we need to do our part because we are responsible people, and which is very important. We are stewards of God's kingdom. And God is the author and the source of everything. We are called to be his stewards, to do the right thing. In the same way, it is important to anticipate obstacles and plan for them. This can involve creating backup plans, seeking advice and guidance from others, and developing resilience and adaptability to navigate unexpected challenges. In the third lesson, perseverance required persistence and determination. Nehemiah did not give up when faced with setbacks. He instead continued to press forward, relying on God's strength and guidance. So perseverance requires persistence and determination. It means continuing to work towards your goal even when progress is slow or setback occurs. It improves a willingness to put in the time, effort, and energy required to achieve your, ob your objectives. And fourth lesson, seek support and guidance from others. Nehemiah didn't face his challenges alone. He sought support and guidance from others, including his team and God. In the same way, it is important to seek support and guidance from others when facing challenges and obstacles. This can involve seeking help from mentors or peers, finding and supporting network of like-minded individuals, or reaching out to a higher power for guidance and strength. The last lesson that we can learn about perseverance, learn from failure and adapt. Nehemiah faced failures and setbacks along the way. But he learned from them and adapted his approach. He didn't let failure discourage him. He instead used it as a learning platform and opportunity to refine his strategy and approach. In the same way, it is important to learn from failure and adapt to it. This means being open to feedback, reflecting on your experiences, and making adjustments to your approach as needed. So what are the three things we learned? First one, 
Amen. Prayer, second one. Amen. Planning, third one. Perseverance. 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 And the fourth one is leadership. Nehemiah demonstrated effective leadership skills throughout the rebuilding process. He motivated and inspired the people, delegate, delegated tasks, and dealt with conflicts in a wise and compassionate manner. So again, here we can learn five lessons. First one, motivate and inspire people. Effective leaders know how to motivate and inspire the team to achieve a common goal. Nehemiah motivated the people by sharing his vision of rebuilding the wall of Jerusalem and the benefits that he it would that would come with it. See, it's for their protection, it's for their future, it's for their generations to come. That is casting the vision and motivating people. You see, a person who is you can never limit a vision, greater vision to yourself. Today, many people are live, they limit vision to themselves. So when they die, the vision also dies. A vision is greater than a person. So you need to involve and engage people to be part of the vision that they take over. You see, today everybody wants to say, I am the center, it's my vision, God gave me and I want to keep it, it's me, me, me. And they are there in the center focus of everything. No, a vision has to be important because it's God's vision, it's not my vision. God gave me this vision, so I include everybody to be part of the vision. And so I become less and God becomes more. And others take precedence over. Even if I go, the vision continues and the work will continue. You understand? That's a good leadership. That's an important to be a good leader. But you own it. You take it. You take responsibility. You can't walk away. You stand in the center. Take the stones. Whatever comes your way. And you give direction. Focus. That's important. Give strength. And people can see and understand and say, okay, this guy is with a vision and I can die for it. Like how Jesus' disciples died for it. Because Jesus was a great and the only great leader who ever lived who gave his life for others. And he empowered others. These 12 people see how amazing and magnitude in which they took the whole world. That's a great leadership we need to understand. He also used his own actions as an example to inspire others to work hard and not to give up. Something that I learned from my father is about faith. No matter what that worst situation, I saw that unshaking faith that God is faithful. Absolutely. That's the confidence that come in relationship with God. <clears throat> it's not a blind faith. So Nehemiah exhibited that as a true leader. And second lesson we can learn is drink water. That's also part of our leadership lesson. Yes. It's yeah, important to drink water. Drink some water. <laughs> Thank you. So this, please don't write it down. It's not drinking water. The second one is delegate tasks. Leaders cannot do everything themselves, as I said. Delegating tasks to help others to ensure that everyone is working towards the same goal and that the workload is shared. Moses would have burned out. He did, of course, taking all the problems, but his father in Jethro comes in and says, hey man, you are going to die if you don't stop. So delegate responsibilities and share the vision and engage people to be part of the vision. Nehemiah delegated tasks to different groups of people based on their strengths and abilities. This allowed each person to contribute in the best way possible. Lesson three, deal with conflicts in a wise and compassionate manner. That's a good leader. Wise, firm, and compassionate. You need to have a soft heart and a sound mind as a leader. Soft heart and a strategic mind as a thinker. See, this is a balance. You can't just have only your sound mind without a soft heart, or only have a soft heart without a sound mind. You, in both ways, you cannot be a leader. You only one side. You have to have that, a good mind, like the lion and the lamb, like Jesus. He's not only the lamb, he's also the lion. He's not only the lion, but he's also the lamb. You see, it's, it's, it's kind of an oxymoron, but it's beautiful how Christian life is. That brings the balance always, not to go any extreme. What is the lesson now we are in? Sorry? Number four. Um, no, number three. Deal with conflict in a wise and compassionate manner. Conflicts can arise during any project. People are like me, like us. We are all different people with different opinion and different things and different strategy. So people are people. 
and it's important for leaders to handle them in a wise and compassionate manner. Nehemiah was able to resolve conflicts between different groups of people by listening to both sides. Sometimes there is a proverb that says, the one who comes first to tell his complaint seems to be right until you hear from the other party. So we need to not to be too quick to listen to one person and judge and make a decision based on that. Listen from both the parties. It's very important. Group, okay, listening from both the sides and finding a solution that was fair for everyone involved. He also showed compassion towards those who were struggling and provided support and encouragement. And lesson four, communicate clearly and effectively. Not like, you know, okay, let's see what happens. No, it, a leader stands, uh, you can judge a leader by his word because it's very determined focus. Let's go, we do this, 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 this. There is room for flexibility, but you need to be firm. Communicate your strategy or vision clearly and effectively. Effective communication is essential for any successful project. Nehemiah communicated clearly and effectively with the people throughout the rebuilding process. He listened to their concerns and ideas, and he also communicated his own expectations and goals clearly. You see, he was not wishy-washy. Somebody comes and say, okay, let's build another wall this side also. No, he said, no, this is what it is, and be focused. And it was very firm and very clear. But he also listened to people, what they said, and then he took that into consideration. The fifth one, lead by example. Leaders must lead by example. Nehemiah set a goal, good example for the people by working hard alongside them and not asking them to do anything he wasn't willing to do himself. There are leaders who can sit and say, hey, do this, do this, do this, they can command. But he set an example by doing himself and doing everything by setting an example. He was the one who was in the front to lead the whole people. He also showed humility and did not take credit for the success of the project, but rather gave credit to God and the people who worked hard to make it happen. Today, many people put a statue and banner, Benjamin's project and Benjamin's thing and whatever he wants. But he said, this is God's project and gold glory goes to him and everybody deserved it. Everyone, the one who took uh, whatever tools in his hand to work for a day or whatever, everybody, the stakeholders were part of the success of the project. That's an effective leader. So remind me again, so what are the first uh, four, four points we saw? Prayer, Prayer. planning, perseverance, leadership. And the fifth one is faith. Nehemiah's faith, Nehemiah's faith in God was the foundation of his actions. You know, without faith, it is impossible to please God. We are people of faith. I told you about mature faith, but now let me go ahead with this lessons we learned. He trusted in God's power and provision, even in the face of adversity. This reminds us that faith is essential in any endeavor as God's people, and that we can accomplish great things when we trust in God. Because God holds all the resources and he is the king of the universe. So there are five lessons we can learn about faith. First one, trust in man's power. Is that what it means? Trust in God's power. So please strike it down. Trust in God's power. Nehemiah trusted that God was all powerful and could help him overcome any obstacle. This gave him confidence he needed, this gave the confidence he needed to take on a daunting task like rebuilding the walls of Jerusalem. When we trust in God's power, we can also have confidence in the face of adversity. David says, even though I walk through the valley of shadow of death, I fear no evil for thou art with me, thy staff and thy rod, they comfort me. So that's the confidence of God's presence being there in the midst of the challenges, not just taking us away from the challenges, in the midst of those problems and difficulties, God comes through and helps to shape our character and mold to become like Jesus. And that's the journey. If God always comes and takes us away from problems, we would never learn anything out of it. But God allows us to walk through certain challenges in life and he helps us to mold our character, to trust him, depend him, become like him, son Jesus. It's important. So trusting in God's power. When we trust in God's power, we can also have confidence in the face of adversity. 
That's the first lesson. Second one, trust in God's provision. Nehemiah believed that God would provide the resources he needed to complete the task at hand. He prayed for God's favor and was able to secure the support of the Persian king. When we trust in God's provision, we can have faith that he will give us what we need to accomplish our goals. Third lesson, perseverance. We talked about it a lot, but Nehemiah faced many challenges and he worked to rebuild the walls of Jerusalem, but he did, didn't give up or lose faith. Instead, he continued to trust in God and worked diligently to accomplish his goals. When we face difficulties, we can draw strength from our faith and persevere through their challenges. Lesson four, it's prayer again. Prayer is an essential part. It's not that once you pray and everything is fine, you keep praying. Nehemiah's faith was grounded in prayer. He regularly prayed to God for guidance, strength, and favor. When we pray, we open ourselves up to God's wisdom and direction, and we invite him to be part of our journey. And lesson five, action. Nehemiah's faith was not just theoretical, a blind faith, faith in action. It was grounded in action. He took bold steps to rebuild the walls of Jerusalem, even in the face of opposition. When we have faith in God, we should motivate us. It should motivate us to take action and make a difference in the world. That's faith. And the sixth one is compassion. Nehemiah showed compassion towards the people of Jerusalem. As I said, to be, have a soft heart is very important, especially those who are poor and marginalized. I told you yesterday, the preamble of the Swiss constitution that states <clears throat> that in the name of God, and it goes on to say the strength of a nation is measured by the well-being of its weakest members. In any country, if the weakest members do excel and they are empowered, that shows that this country is a strong country and the leadership is a good leadership. When you see so much of poverty and poor people and in the midst of that, there are many who are rich and affluent who don't care, then there is a big imbalance in the economy and also the structure of the society. So here, compassion is very important. As I said, Nehemiah showed compassion towards the people of Jerusalem, especially those who are poor and marginalized. He took action to address their needs and worked to ensure that justice was done. He highlights, I mean, this highlights the importance of empathy and concerns for others in our lives. Empathy is putting ourselves into somebody's shoes and understanding their feelings and emotions with them. You see, um, com to have compassion is one thing, but to show empathy is really you can relate with that problem. Like when I lost my brother to COVID in, um, in Saudi Arabia in 2020, it was a painful experience. He was called the Apostle of Saudi Arabia. He established like several hundred ch underground churches with several thousand secret believers. So it was very shocking. He was 51 and when he passed away, he couldn't do anything. We couldn't see his body. We don't know where he was buried. You know, everything was extremely painful, extremely painful. But at the same time, it also gives us the hope to know that God is sovereign and the seed that he's sown will certainly produce much fruit, which we saw last year when we had 12 member delegation from the Royal Commission of Saudi Arabia coming to us to tell us, can you please teach us leadership? It's incredible. And then to say this, I can feel now when people come and tell that I lost someone and, you know, because I have gone through that grief or still going through that grief. So that's empathy. Without that, I cannot say, oh, I know how you feel. Sometimes we don't know how what the feeling of is something without going through it. So empathy is very important. And uh, he took actions to address the needs and work to ensure justice was done. So this highlights the importance of empathy and concern for others in our lives. Here are some practical lessons that we can learn from Nehemiah. There are five practical lessons about compassion. First, listen with empathy. Nehemiah, Nehemiah, so Nehemiah's compassion towards the people of Jerusalem started with the willingness to listen to the stories and understand their struggles. Give attentive ear to people, those who God has put in your relationship with, with you. Not to be a selective listener, listen carefully. Not only the verbal communication, but the non-verbal cues that people talk about. Sometimes we are very, only what we say matters and no, we, you know, I think it's 10%, it's 20%, 10% uh, 
people communicate and the rest is non-verbal. I don't know the statistics, but anyways, it's important to listen to people carefully of the words that they speak and words they don't speak. Um, and understand their struggles and their stories. And to develop compassion, we need to listen to others with empathy and be willing to put ourselves in their shoes. Here, when Jesus came on this earth and he was in the Sermon on the Mount, he sees huge number of people come to listen to his message. What, was the, what did the Bible verse say? When he saw the large crowd of people, what happened? He was moved with compassion. Do you have a compassionate heart when you see people? I never had this before. When I see people drug addict or people smoking, I didn't even care about them. I said, oh, these guys are gone and lost. If we don't have compassion to the lost world, something is deeply wrong with your faith. Literally. That's an important thing for God's people to have compassion for the brokenhearted, for the weak, for the vulnerable, for the lost. So it should, I mean, only the, you see, it's the love of the Lord that's poured out into our hearts. It's not that we are naturally, we can have compassion to those who are not like us, but it is only God's love that's being poured out into our hearts can move us to greater level of compassion. We need to listen to others with empathy and willingness to put ourselves in issues. Okay, that second, take action. Compassion to drive us to take action to help others. Nehemiah's compassion led him to take action and work towards addressing the need of the people of Jerusalem. We should follow Nehemiah's example and take practical steps to help those in need. Some people have good compassion, but they are zero in action. I have a, we, I tell you this, this is a story about our friend uh, whom uh, many years ago in the Bible study, she would say, oh, I cannot come to India. Oh, it's so such a, I can't stand poverty. I can't stand poor people suffering. I can't, it's so bad. It's really, I hate, I'm moved with compassion. But she would never do anything to address that. Not even a single penny to help some poor children. Nothing. But she thinks that she has compassion. The compassion without action is not compassion in the first place at all. It's just feeling remorse and feeling bad. If you don't do something to address with that, or whether you give your time, or if somebody's hurt, and you sit with them, drink a coffee, that's compassion in action. You really give your time for that person. Or you see somebody's hurt and say, oh, I feel so sorry for you, and you walk away. That's not true compassion. So important that is, compassion should come with action. Third, address injustice. Nehemiah's compassion was not limited to addressing the needs of the poor and marginalized. He also worked to ensure that justice was done and the people were treated fairly. We should strive to be advocates for justice and work towards addressing the root cause of social injustice. It's important to understand the injustice that we see in the world and to be a part of the solution, not part of the problem. You see, there is a sin of commission and there is also a sin of omission that Bible talks about. What you do as deliberately or mistakenly is also sin, but what you don't do when you know what you should do, and that's also a sin when you keep silent. As I told the story yesterday, the, the speaking bird, when it didn't speak, what happened? It was eaten. So when we don't say and speak and stand up for truth and righteousness and justice, then our values and things will be eaten up. So stand for justice. Then sometimes I hear many Christians say, oh, God will take care of that. You know, our job is just to think about how, to, how do we have a good church and things like that. We should not say anything because God will bring justice. Yeah, of course, God will bring justice. But if, if you go walk on the road and somebody slaps your child, you will not say, oh, God will do justice. I will just close my eyes. No, you fight. You just protect your child. But when it comes to you, you want to defend and you want justice. When it comes to others, God will take care of them. I think we need to really step up and to understand that we all, all of God's children made in his image and we need to do the right thing by being the voice for the voiceless, for the broken, for the hurt in the world. You understand? Fourth, practice generosity. Nehemiah's compassion was not just limited to his words and actions. He also practiced generosity by providing financial, financial assistance to those in need. We can develop compassion by being generous with our time, resources, and talents to help those in need. Last lesson, 
lesson five, be persistent. Again and again, you see the word persistent, compassion, prayer, it keeps coming all the time. Nehemiah's compassion was not a one-time act. Sometimes we think, okay, today I gave my tithe, I'm fine, I'm done with it. He persisted in his efforts to help the people of Jerusalem. Even in the face of opposition and setbacks, we should learn from Nehemiah's persistence and not give up on our efforts to help others. So that's lesson six. So again, remind me of the lessons, six lessons that you learned. Praying. Prayer, Prayer. Uh, planning, planning. planning. perseverance, perseverance. Faith. leadership, leadership. Faith. faith, compassion. compassion. And the last one is humility. Nehemiah was not motivated by personal ambition or desire for power. He recognized that his role was to serve God and his people, and he approached his task with humility and a servant heart. He committed himself completely for the service of the vision that God gave and to fulfill the task. Isn't it amazing? He didn't want to become a superhero. Wow. At the end, everybody would say, oh, that's Benji, 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 wow. David did not go with that motive to fight against Goliath. He didn't say to Goliath, today that the world will know that there is a king in Israel and his name is David. No, he didn't say that. He said, today the world will know that there is a living God and he's the God of Israel. Every project, everything that God gives you should end up for his glory, not for our name and for his name's sake. That's very important to understand that. It's not just only in theory, in practical, that's humility. That's really hard, absolutely difficult. Because we all want somehow our names to be there. But of course, our names are there in the book of life. And also when we do things in the godly way, generations will speak of our legacy. That when we live for ourselves on this earth, only at that point of time people will speak about us. And we are forgotten and lost forever. There are three lessons here. Humility. First one, focus on the greater good. One practical lesson we can learn from Nehemiah's humility is to focus on the greater good rather than the personal ambition or desires. Nehemiah recognized that his ultimate goal was to serve God and his people. And he approached his task with this mindset. When we prioritize the need of others and work towards a common goal, we can accomplish great things and make a positive impact in the world. Lesson two, listen to others. Another lesson we can learn from Nehemiah's humility is to listen to others. Throughout the book of Nehemiah, we see that see him seeking counsel from others and taking their feedbacks into <coughs> consideration. This allowed him to make better decisions and build stronger relationships with those around him. When we listen to others and va value those perspectives, we can learn from the experience and build a sense of unity and collaboration. And three, serve others. Lastly, we can learn from Nehemiah's example of serving others. He approached his task with a servant heart. Servant leadership is what kingdom leadership is all about. We not only make a positive impact in the lives of others. Sorry, when we serve others with humility, we not only make a positive impact in the life of others, but also develop a sense of gratitude and fulfillment within ourselves. By finding ways to help those around us, we can build strong connections and foster a sense of community. Humility is not being a doormat. Uh, I'm a poor Benji, you can walk over me. I'm a doormat. No, the Bible, it's very aggressive. It's very strong. It's very firm. It's standing for truth, doing the right thing. Humility is not, uh, you know, uh, it's not a weakness. It's a strength. The world doesn't have it. Being arrogant and pride is a weakness. You fall and you fail. Being humble is a strength. We shouldn't take it very lightly, being humble. Only God can make us humble. So there we stop. So in conclusion, the life of the life and work of Nehemiah teaches valuable lessons about prayer, prayer, prayer planning, 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 perseverance, perseverance leadership, leadership, faith, faith compassion, and, and humility. These lessons can inspire us to pursue our goals with determination and to live our lives in a way that honors God and serve others. So I just want to finish with one example. That's walking the narrow way. I have told uh, this you before, but I can tell it again. 
The Christian life is it's an amazing journey, a journey full of excitement, a journey that is that is hopeful, that brings life forth, that it, but it has its own pain, the walk of journey. God does not take away those challenges, but we pray sometimes. It's like a woman giving birth to a child. You see, she is pregnant with life, and giving birth to a life is not easy, carrying nine months. She is not, in, of course, she's enjoying for the future to come, that where she looks forward to hold the baby, but she suffers the stretching pain that she goes through. See, and finally, in the, then also then comes the birth pain. Within with that pain, she gives birth to a child. And then comes the joy. Because sometimes many people say that Christian life is a God, take everything on the cross. You should not suffer, you don't have pain. Of course, if you sit simply and do nothing, that's different. But when you are filled with doing God's task, what God has given you, there would be challenges, there would be problems, there would be difficulties. That's the enemy who wants to attack. But you focus on Jesus. Jesus is the author and perfect of our faith. Fix our eyes upon him. But those setbacks should not demotivate us like Nehemiah. He was attacked on every front. Was not God with him? God was with him. But through the eyes of faith, he moved on. He took those pain. He took those beatings. But he continued to do the work in which God has called us. So we need to understand and learn to put that in perspective. Not just simply think kind of a superhero fantasies and something that can happen. No, it's a real life. It's beautiful life, but it's a life, a journey that's good. But it's not a life. You see, Christian life is a journey, isn't it? It's a life, it's a race of journey. The race is not about competition. The worldly race is all about competition. Who wins? But Christian journey is about completion. How we finish our journey. And this journey is that we are called to run together. It's not an individual journey. Mm -hmm. Do you get that? Get that in your mind. It's not an individual journey. We all run together. It's not the journey of the pastors or bishops or I don't know whomsoever you call it. But it is God's people. Anyone who called on the name of the Lord, mm -hmm. who are his children, we need to run this race. So walking the narrow way is a picture that often we see in Sunday school. I have seen the picture that put that there is this narrow way and then the broad way. People going the broad way go to hell. People walking the narrow way goes to heaven. You see? But uh, later on when I read the Bible and I came to understand that there is only one way, not two ways. There is only one way that is a broad way that everybody walks in it. But there is no narrow way there. But the narrow way is done by God's people that you turn around and walk the other way midst of these people. So that's where we are ridiculed and we laughed at and people don't understand us. But you keep walking and you're not walking alone. God is with you and he makes the way, but you walk and you put that step and you also take many people along with you and you go ahead to the path of eternity. And you have already created a way for many others to follow. Do you understand that? It's a pain, painful journey. If it is just an adjacent road where you can just walk a narrow way, that's fine. Then we will be kind of a, a, a kind of a, what is it called? A, a cult kind of a group of people just kind of disconnected from the world and we have our own way. No, this is right in the midst of the world. God wants us to walk away, I mean, against the tides towards him. And then you create a narrow way. That's what he says. He makes the way in the desert and streams in the wasteland. That's what through his children he does that. Do you understand? We understand this we should understand some passage very clearly in the context. We, when we think that God would make a way, yes, how does he make the way? To us, to his people. The earth will be filled with the knowledge of the glory of God as the waters covers the sea. He didn't say the earth will be filled with the glory of God. The earth is filled with his glory because God created it. But what does it say? The earth will be filled with the knowledge of the glory. How does this knowledge happen? To his children. So that is man's responsibility. Who, wait, who makes the narrow way? God. And who is walking to make the narrow way with God? His people. Do you understand? It's not that, oh, don't worry, God will make a way and we can just go. No, Moses had to go in the front with his staff and then he part the Red Sea to walk others to walk this way. So these are some of the valuable lessons that we can learn from the life of Nehemiah and uh,
it's interesting to note that we need to be a people who can think, who can use our mind, who can use our reason, our heart, and uh, to walk in his ways. And we need to challenge the kind of uh, setup that we live in, where we are put up in a church setting or whatever, to see how our church can be engaging in bringing this truth of the gospel to the world. How we can set arrows to places like people in the place of politics and business and economy and other spheres of influence to transform the society and culture to godly values. It is taken over. This is the place. Where do we make narrow ways? Where do we make this narrow path? We need to make narrow paths in the, in the public square, in uh, the politics or uh, anywhere. What, what did, why did he build the wall? Where are the broken ruins? Why did he build the wall in the first place? Building wall is security. Enemies cannot come in and you are secure. He is not thinking about him. He's thinking about his future generations. So you need to understand this gap that's been created, the wall that's been broken in our system, the government and the church as well, and try to rebuild those walls with the help of God's people. That's reality, I'm not speaking some rocket science here. That's what, it could be very simple. Even in your marriage relationship, there are broken walls that you can mend it. Even in your relationship with your family or with your friends or community, you can identify where are the broken walls and see to it to see, okay, I'm not going to be passively passed by, but I want to do something for God's glory. You understand? Then call for others. People will join. Not everybody can be leaders, but everybody can do what God has called us to do and for his glory. Okay. I stop there and over to you for questions, thoughts, and anything you want to ask.